Hey everyone, my name is Chelsea. Welcome to Little Mountain Ranch. I am very happy to have you here with me today on this absolutely spe whoa, <laughs> spectacular and spectacularly slippery as well day here on the ranch. It is so beautiful. Right now I am heading down to check on fireweed. Fireweed is my milk cow. She was born in 2017 at the very end of the worst fire season we have ever had. We were actually evacuated from our place for 47 days and it was crazy. Thankfully, the fire didn't actually end up coming over the mountain. It stayed on the other side. Firefighters did an amazing job keeping the fire breaks up so that it didn't hit our little valley, but we were evacuated for a long time. And when we got back, about two weeks after we got home, fireweed was born. And I asked you guys to um, make name suggestions and someone suggested fireweed. And fireweed is an herb that grows here wild and it usually comes up after a fire. So it was the absolutely perfect name for her. She is due to calve any minute. So I'm just going down to do my check. I checked her around 7.30 this morning. I checked her in the middle of the night last night. And while she does look very close to having a calf, she has not yet gone into labor yet. So I'm just gonna keep regular checks on her for the next while until obviously she has her calf. So I have a little funny story to share with you about cow, cow watching or calf watching. Um, a couple of years ago, <laughs> I was sharing on Instagram information about how to tell when your when your cow is going to calve. And we were up on the hill, I was up with my cow and she was due to calve any minute. So as I was standing there talking to everyone and sharing how to tell when your cow is going to calve, being thoroughly convinced that my cow had all the symptoms of a cow about to calve, when what should come out from behind a tree but a little calf. So my cow had actually already calved by, um, by the time I was giving this really detailed lesson on how to cow or how to tell when your cow is actually gonna calve. So needless to say, I do know the signs. They're not always reliable. And so maybe don't take advice from me on how to tell when your cow is going to calve. So the other day about, was it yesterday morning? I think it was yesterday morning. I was down here sharing with everyone over on Instagram. I share something um, called stories over on Instagram every day. And I was talking about how I really believed that fireweed, who is right here looking hugely pregnant, was going to calf any minute. She was moaning, like vocalizing. She was stretching out. She looked like she was having contractions. I was so convinced, in fact, that I brought my camera down so that I could share with you the live birth, but obviously, no calf. So there's a couple different things you're gonna look for. You see how swollen she is on her back end? That is definitely a good sign that she is going to have a baby fairly soon. Right in this area right here, so this is her hip bone. This is a lot easier to tell when they're standing up. This is her hip bone and this is her tail head right here. And there's a ligament that attaches the um, hip bone to the tail head and that will pretty much dissolve right out. Um, about 12 hours or so before they're going to calve. And the purpose for that is to help to move their hips so that the calf can get out more easily. So that's a pretty good sign. The other sign is, you can't tell very well because she's laying down, but the other sign is a big, huge, swollen udder. Although once a cow has had one calf, that's less of a reliable way to be able to tell if your cow's going to calve because they can bag out weeks before and even be dripping milk. A friend of mine was just telling me that her cow was dripping milk for 10 days before she finally calved. But um, that is an, uh, an indicator that of course they're, they're close to calving. And then the other way, maybe if she stands up in a little bit, I can show you this, but their belly will hang down really, really low, dropping similar to the way that human babies drop down into the pelvis. Um, same kind of thing with a cow. So the reason that fireweed is in under this undercovered area here is because we have so much snow right now and it's actually still quite cold and I do not want her calving out here in our field area where the snow is really deep because obviously that's not safe for the calf. So this time of year, we do bring our cows into an undercovered area like this. Once the snow's off the ground and it's dry out in the field, they're much happier if they can be out in the field and choose where they're going to calve. But for safety reasons, we want her in where it's nice and safe 
warm and dry. My little sheep ladies over here are doing absolutely fabulously. They are getting rounder by the second, so I'm very hopeful that at least a few of them are bred. The white sheep, this big girl right here, she's not quite as shy as she was, but the two young ones, they are still super shy. There's one of our barn rabbits in here who likes being out here with the sheep. Hi ladies, are you gonna let me get up close? It's all right. This girl, I have to the point where she's, she's pretty friendly. Hi. That's a girl. This is Hazel. She is super sweet. We have her to the point now where we can pet her. Briar is another one that I have to the point now where I can pet her. I still like to move nice and slow because I don't want to scare them. Oh, their wool feels so cool. You want to scratch right in there, lady? But as you can see, these ladies are having none of it. Let's see if I can give her a little scratch. That's it, girl. Hi. Hey there. Hey, that's the first time I've been able to touch her. That's fantastic. Slowly but surely, we are working our way into friendling up these sheep. Okay. Okay, let's get this twine in the garbage trailer. And now we'll head back up to the house. We're going to plant tomatoes today. Super excited about that and a few other odds and ends. So when I was going through my seeds, I found tons of different varieties that I haven't tried yet that I had in my seed stash. So I think I'm probably gonna do a mostly Amish paste and Manitoba bush. And those will be for um, canning mostly. And then there are several, several <laughs> other varieties that I think we're gonna try. It is tempting to pull out one of my um, picnic tables onto the deck and do this outside because it is just absolutely beautiful out here. Oh, never mind, scratch that. My deck is covered in a foot of snow. I actually need to head downstairs. We have a friend here helping down with the renovations and they have a question for me. What's up, gentlemen? Well, we're really, I'm like, we're just trying to choose light locations. Oh, okay. Okay, let me show you where we're at. So I think last time I showed you, we did have the new window in. And when I say we, I actually mean our friend Donovan and my husband, Dan, because I actually, this is probably the first renovation that I have not been a part of, which feels kind of weird, but it's really lovely to have the extra help. So we have the window, we have the ceiling all on, and we decided to go with a drywall ceiling in most of the basement. There's a couple areas that might have to have drop ceiling just based on where the heating ducts and stuff are. We have the open area here. So this used to be closed, a closed in family room. So we put in the pony wall here with this, and then that's our boot room area. We have a new door down here. So the guys have been working over here on this. This is for all of our plumbing and they have it all wired up so that they can actually turn each individual space off, which is super convenient. And then they have just installed this. What is this exactly? A UV disinfectant and then a filter. So our water is spring water and it can have some silt in it. So that'll help filter that out. And then there is a small section of our um, water system that is exposed to the air. So being able to have that in there will help to disinfect it, which is fantastic. And then they moved the washer and dryer, sorry, kind of weird light there. Um, the washer and dryer over here and then Dan's gonna build a tabletop, which is the same as the countertop, which is currently being used as a workbench um, that we have in the freeze dryer room over here. So that's gonna look really beautiful. And then we're going to be putting this vanity that is in here, it's just sitting here right now, or not vanity, sink. Um, over where Dan is standing and that'll be a place for the kids to have a hand washing uh, station that's not like up in the kitchen or in the bathroom that's down here. And then the last thing is this little bathroom over here. This is what you guys are moving on to next. We're done this part, yeah. Nice, that's so exciting. So, <laughs> whoa, something just happened to my voice there. <laughs> so this is super exciting because we have had only one bathroom in our house for just about a year now. So a second bathroom is gonna be fantastic. We're going to start with dividing out 
some snapdragons. I did not expect them to grow so incredibly well and so easily. So I'm probably gonna divide them out into, I don't know, three per little cell pot. This is the first time that I have ever done snapdragons, so it's kind of an experiment. One thing I am going to do is go along and clip off the tops of ooh, the plants. Might need some little scissors for that. They actually have a pretty sturdy little stem um, and that will help to create a bushier plant. So I'm going to split them up. Here, I'll bring you down a little closer so that you can see what I'm doing nice and close up. Okay, there we are. So all I'm doing is dividing these up into little clumps like so. I'm actually gonna pull off anything that's just little and not growing well. Gently split these up and plunk two per cell here, I think. In my last video, I shared planting, what seeds were we planting? All kinds of seeds and all my pepper seeds. And I gave a lot of information about actually planting. So rather than rehashing all of that again, I'll link that video if you wanna go and see that. And in today's video, I won't show planting every single seed <laughs> the way that I did in my last one. I'll just give you a little glimpse of each one that I'm doing. So I'm gonna put them in the soil like this, add a little bit of extra potting soil in there, top them up. My grow room is going to get so packed. I think I definitely over planted these. <laughs> I do, don't think I need uh, over a hundred snapdragons. So the other thing that we are going to be dividing out today are our thyme and our oregano. I always plant it very densely like this and then I usually divide each one of these clumps into a couple of smaller ones. Oh my gosh, that smells so good. Okay, that is the timer for today's bread. So I'm just gonna go and get that popped into the oven. Yes, please, honey, thank you. Sometimes um, thyme and oregano are perennial here and sometimes not. So I always make sure to plant a little bit so that I'm guaranteed to have my herbs. Okay, I think I'm gonna plant this little one in a pot to be up in my kitchen. It's starting to definitely feel like gardening season is in full swing around here. The other thing that I am kind of glad about as far as potting these up is that I am getting them in some fresh soil. So the other thing that makes me kind of happy about getting all of this done is that I'm getting them into some fresh soil because if you remember, I was having some soil issues with ProMix soil. And so I'm planting these in organic sun grow, which is what I always use. And I've never had an issue with it. And anything I did plant in it has done well this year. So I, um, I'm glad to have these into some fresh soil. Give them a little extra boost. I do have a couple of other plants that I'm gonna to start today too. I'm going to start some eggplant and also some chamomile. Chamomile self-seeds uh, in our area a little bit, but again, just so that I make sure that I have some, I always plant a few every year. It's pretty fast growing though. It's not one that you have to start super early. Super tiny seeds and almost every seed always seems to germinate. So don't put too many in each cell. So I'm just gonna start four of those. And I am out of my yogurt containers, so I am going to be using some popsicle sticks for these ones, but I'll end up having to replace them. I just find the popsicle sticks, because we have to start so early, they end up uh, rotting and snapping off or the ink ends up wearing off before they actually go out in the garden. So I really find the yogurt containers have been working super well for me. 
Okay, we are going to do those. We'll do the eggplants. Okay, eggplants grow really well in my high tunnel. So I'm gonna grow two seeds per um, cell and these are a blend. And I've grown all of these varieties and I like them all. And this one's a West Coast seed pack. So we'll do two seeds per cell. How many do I wanna do? Probably just four. Okay, there's our eggplant. What else did we have? Ah, honeywort. If you love bees and bringing pollinators to your garden, honeywort is a fabulous plant to grow. I grew it last year. I'm actually gonna plant quite a few of them. And my bees and the bumblebees loved it. And by the way, I just checked my honeybees and all three hives are still alive. I'm waiting for a warm day so that I can go out and put a little bit of um, sugar cake in there just so that they don't end up running out of food today. So I, you know what we'll do is we'll put some of our sun gold cherry tomatoes. These are the only cherries that I'm gonna be growing, cherry tomatoes that I'm gonna grow this year. I'm just gonna grow. Actually, I'll plant a few extra for my mama and my mother-in-law. Okay, one tray down. Our maters, we are going to do an entire tray of Manitoba bush, hopefully. Okay, so that was only actually eight, nine, 10, 11, 12 seeds in that pack, not 20. Oh my goodness, this package is empty. What the heck? Somewhere I have misplaced my Manitoba seeds because this package was empty, which means it's one of last year's. Hmm, I'm gonna have to go on a seed hunt. So we will just tag these ones so that I know that these ones are Manitoba bush. And then the rest of this, we will do San Marzano. And this is a new tomato for me. I have not planted these before, but I have heard really good things about these tomatoes. And this is an Italian paste tomato, which are my favorite tomatoes to can because they're so meaty and they make such nice sauce. So I'm gonna plant all these seeds, two per cell, because I do have quite a few of these ones. And do you know what I noticed when I'm planting seeds? I noticed this in my last video, that my voice gets really quiet, <laughs> like I'm around a baby or something. Next up, I'm gonna try Cherokee Purple. Also have heard great things about these ones. These tomatoes, I really like tomatoes that are quite acidic and have a really strong flavor. And that's what these ones say about them is that they're a very bold flavored tomato. Okay, and I did promise I wasn't gonna show you me planting every single seed in today's video. So I'll just let you know, maybe what we'll do right now is we'll take a pause on the actual planting and I'll just show you what varieties I am growing today. All right, so let me run you through all of the tomatoes that I am going to be planting this year. So we already did the Manitoba bush, Cherokee purple, and sun gold. What else did we do? Oh, right, and, and then the San Marzano. So Manitoba bush are ones that I grow every year. They are a bush style plant, so they don't require pruning. They, don't, they do require some staking because they can get quite heavily laden with tomatoes, um, but they grow really well in a short season and in a cooler climate. So they're a good one for a Northern garden. But the, oh, and the sun gold are also one I've been growing for the last two years and they do pretty well up here. The Cherokee purple and the San Marzano are both new to me. The Old German is probably my favorite slicing tomato. It is absolutely delicious. These are beautiful tomatoes and we do have a hard time growing really large slicers up here in the north, but these ones do quite well. So I always grow some of those. And then there's an orange Russian tomato that I have not yet tried, but looks to be quite similar. So I'm gonna try two of these 
and probably two of these. What else do we have over here? We have Bull's Heart. Bull's Heart is one that I have grown before, and this one is a like a meaty beefsteak style tomato. Gunmetal Gray is an absolutely gorgeous tomato. It's kind of a medium size tomato, and it really does have kind of a silvery sheen to the outside of it. It's beautiful and it is delicious. So I'm just, that's just gonna be an eating tomato. So I'll probably just do, sorry, we have some drills going on in the background, but um, I'm probably just gonna do one or two of those. New one for me is the Paul Robson, but I have heard really good things about this tomato. Amish paste, which I always do tons of. Pink brandy wine, also one that I've grown before that I love lots. Lots and lots of Amish paste, slicer. This one is Moon Glow Orange Slicer Tomato, a new one. Star, uh, Starfire Green Sal Saladente <laughs> Tomato, which I'm assuming is a good salad tomato. Um, Antho Beef Steak Tomato and a the Arctic Rose, which I'm actually growing over here. Let me show you. I think what I might do here, let me show you. Um, so the Arctic Rose beefsteak tomato, that's actually what this is. It's a dwarf, um, not a micro dwarf, but a dwarf tomato. And I think I might start a couple of these to go out on my deck because this one's been growing inside under challenging conditions. It had really poor soil. It wasn't doing well in the grow room since I brought it up to the window with a grow light. Um, combined like the natural light from the window and the grow light and gave it some fertilizer. It is doing much, much better. As you can see, we have a couple of tomatoes on there. So I am going to start a couple of those. The other dwarf tomato that I'm going to do is this one, and this one's called Broody Hen. And it is also looking much better than it was. And we have lots of new flowers on here. So I, whenever I show tomatoes growing indoors or growing in my high tunnel, I always get asked about pollination. So all you need to do in order to pollinate your tomato plants, because tomato flowers have both the male and female parts on them, so they pollinate themselves, but they do require either some wind to blow through or a little bit of a tap on the stem just to dislodge that pollen and get it onto the stamen. So that's all you need to do to pollinate. I actually have my tomatoes in my high tunnel strung up on cattle panels and all I do is grab one end of the cattle panel and shake it and it shakes all my tomatoes in that row at once. Okay, that is I think it as far as tomatoes go. This is many more varieties than I was planning on growing but why the heck not? So I'm just gonna get to planting all of these and once they are all planted, I will come back and kind of give you an overview of what I've done. I don't know how many trays we're gonna end up with in the end, maybe five or six. And then of course I do have to divide out the rest of the snapdragons, which is going to be a little bit time consuming. I might enlist some little hands to help me with these ones. Okay, so we have all the stuff. This is all the stuff I showed you earlier, the tomatoes, all the different varieties of tomatoes here. I also decided to do some early cabbages some collard, some leaf cabbage, um, cauliflower, and some broccoli. This is all tomatoes too, actually. This is, um, so I did some broccoli, some cauliflower. Uh-oh, what did I do here? Gosh darn it, I've been so determined not to forget to tag, and I don't have tags on these ones. Let's see, can we find a seed in here and see if we can figure out what it was. Maybe I didn't plant here and just covered this part up with dirt. Darn it. So I guess we're gonna have to wait and see. We are gonna have some mystery plants after all. Now what we're gonna do is take another walk down to the barn and check on fireweed. And then we're going to pause the video for today because we're actually going out for dinner with one of our sons. It's his birthday today. So we're gonna take him out for dinner and we'll be back at whatever we're gonna get up to tomorrow, tomorrow. Yeah, it's just not common, but they can twin, yes. And look at that udder, good gracious. So no calf yet. So we're just gonna keep on calf watch and hopefully we'll be able to catch it on camera for you guys. 
Okay, so we're going to sign off for today, head out for supper with our son, whose birthday it is, and be back with you guys again tomorrow. Bye. Okay, we are now on to day two in this video and fireweed has still not had her calf. I just went down and checked on her. Her udder is even more massive than it was yesterday, but she still has not started calving yet. So I will hopefully be able to get that on video for you in the next video because I have pretty much no doubt that she will be calving before our next video comes out on Tuesday. So um, where are we at right now? So my daughter just made some beautiful granola for breakfast tomorrow. So this is an almond granola. She likes to make that once a week for breakfast. I am going to make some uh, zucchini bread right now. We're doing a freezer clean out or have been over the last couple of days. And we found a whole bunch of zucchini and oh, it's dripping everywhere in the bottom of one of my freezers. So I'm going to make a gigantic batch of zucchini bread. That's what I decided to do this afternoon. So for this recipe that I'm doing, I uh, think I need four cups. Let's double check that here. Yes, I actually need four and a half cups of zucchini, which I definitely have here. However, some of it is still a little bit frozen. Three quarters of a cup of brown sugar. A three cups of granulated sugar. One and a half cups of applesauce. And a cup of oil. And six eggs. Three teaspoons of vanilla. So we'll mix all this up and then we will add in our zucchini once it's thawed. Are you making something? I am, I'm making some zucchini bread. I think what you smell is your sister's granola that she made. I think you're smelling your sister's granola. Mm -hmm. I go slow on the hazel sheet because I do I'm too. Yep. And then I put my hand out if she would come. And she did. She let you this time? <laughs> That's She let me this morning too, or yesterday actually. She let me walk up to her and pet her. Okay, how many? Yep, you can. Okay, so we needed four and a half cups of this zucchini. So there's two, four, and and five. Mix that all together. I think it was supposed to be four and a half, but I put in five. Why not a little bit extra? Four and a half cups of flour. One and a half teaspoons of baking powder. And of course, everything in my world is give or take the same of baking soda. Same of salt. And the same of cinnamon. And a little extra. And I'm going to add just a little bit more flour as I added a little bit of extra zucchini, which had lots of water in it. So a little extra flour will help balance it out. Because of the sugar in this sweet bread, I do find it tends to stick a little bit more than say my yeast threads do. So I always go a little bit heavier on the olive oil than I do for the other breads or butter. You could definitely use a butter as well. Mm -hmm. 
So we're baking these at 350 for just under an hour. And now I'm gonna clean up and I'll be back with you again shortly. Bread, looking beautiful. And I'm gonna let this cool off just a little bit before I take it out of those pans, but I can hardly wait to slice into a piece of that. Let's take a piece of this. Nothing quite as delicious as a, come on, there we go, as a hot piece of bread with butter on it. Any kind of bread, but zucchini bread is extra delicious. Definitely should have let that cool off just a little bit more. But that looks really tasty. I am so excited to have homemade dairy products again. I cannot wait. Butter making, yogurt making, cheese making, all the things. I have a confession though. I am probably the worst cheese maker ever. <laughs> and I am determined that this year I am going to overcome that and become a good cheesemaker, or at least a halfway as decent cheesemaker and not ruin all the cheeses I try to make. Oh my word, look at that. Yum. Okay, let's give it a try. Pretty much like cake. Delish. All right, my friends, that is it for today's video. I hope you enjoyed it and I look forward to seeing you next time. Bye.